I'm going to call my friend and my brother right up, right away. Ricky Bolden is going to come on up. I'm going to introduce you with my arm around you. Amen. And I just want to say that uh, already we feel this great friendship, and, and he's been a brother to us from the moment we picked him up at the airport. Uh, we, Matt and I got to drive up to a church in Maine, and we met Ricky. He was preaching that day, and I said, we got to have him here at our church Amen. because there's something about his heart, there's something about his relationship with Jesus, and I know he's going to pour into us tonight. So Ricky Bolden's going to give us this word Thank you, this brother. evening. Amen. Amen. How am I doing back there? Am I okay? Do I not have it on? Yes. Oh, good. Can you, you all can hear me? Yes. So, so the, the thing is, especially the first night, you know, you're trying to, oh, you want to see my pack? Amen. I probably messed it up. Uh, does that look close? There we go. Well, you know, anytime you come to a place, specifically uh, the first time, you're trying to get to know people, right? And so I thought I'd tell you a little bit about uh, my life and uh, where I came from and, you know, what the Lord is doing. Is that all right? And then I thought I would kind of shift into the Word. Because, you know, I don't just simply come and preach a sermon and go home. I probably consider what the Lord wants me to share with you. And I try to share that and be very faithful as I share that. And I'm going to do that tonight. And then, you know, I just want to, I want to warn you that just depend upon how the, the spirit moves. I might even ask for a response uh, to the word. Because, you know, whenever a person uh, takes uh, an eat of the word of God, some kind of response should occur, right? right. And, so, and so that's going to be so... Just to give you a little bit about myself, I was born and raised in Dallas, Texas. And you know what I'm really shocked about is how most people, they don't realize it, but I'm from the hood. Amen. Have you ever heard of the hood? And the hood, is just, it just means the neighborhood. I grew up in the inner city. And, and growing up in the inner city, it's just all kind of problems and pains that I grew up with in Dallas. You know, when I was 11, my father died of cancer, stage 4 cancer, and then, you know, uh, a year later, my baby brother Charles picked up a gun and shot himself in the head. And, that, you know, I kind of looked at that as normal in the hood. And then the following year, my brother Wallace, uh, he was tried as an adult for armed robbery and went to prison. And I'm thinking, like, Lord, how in the world do you navigate, you know, all of this drama? And then my brother Wallace got out of prison and he was shot 13 times and beaten the head with a shovel. And I'm trying to figure this out, right? And then all of a sudden, I'm in the hood, and I think I'm going to really kind of get out alive, but then I get shot. And so I've got two bullet holes in my leg because I was running. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, you know what I'm going man. And so, and I said, okay, Lord, that's cool. You know, I'm going to continue. But then my brother Keith, he's been in prison since 1987. He's still there today. And uh, my brother Keith said that he'll, he, he wrote me a letter and said, I'll never get out of prison. I'll be there the rest of my life. And what, can you imagine, some of, some of you weren't born in 1987. And my brother's been in prison that long. And so when I look at that, my mother died when I was only 28 years old. So I've had to live most of my adult life without a mother or a father. And, and so, but God has used that. And he has just really honored and blessed my life. I had the privilege of using football to get out of the hood. I did, I'm telling you, I did. I was an athlete. I wanted to play sports. I played sports. Very good at it, believe it or not. Uh, I went to, I was in high school. I was what they call a high school All-American, which means that you're halfway decent. And then, and then I, got, I went and I went to a college called SMU, Southern Methodist University. And we had some good athletes there. You know, we had a guy like Eric Dickerson. Uh, who, Eric Dickerson, you know, this guy still holds a, a, a NFL rushing record, a single season rushing record. And so Eric's in the Hall of Fame, a guy I played with when I was drafted by the Cleveland Browns. Isaac Newsom, he's in the Hall of Fame. And so I've been, God's been so good to me. And I'm like, God, look where you brought me from. And it is only by his grace. That I'm standing here tonight, huh? Amen. And so my, amen, amen. amen. My guest used to always sing a song, and I used to love hearing her sing because she was like my spiritual mother. And it was saying, she, she she was singing a song. There is no secret what God can do. Amen. What He's done for others, He will do for you. Amen. And I, you know, I really rest in that. I believe that God desires to bless all of our lives. And when we surrender to his will, isn't that right? right. Yeah. And so I won't be very long. Amen. Well, it depends if I'm going to be long. Really, it depends. <laughs> because I can't get long winded. Now, a lot of it is going to depend upon your response. Like, if you don't say amen, I preach for a long time. 
I mean, we'll, we'll wake up in the morning. We'll go have breakfast together. I'll still be preaching. <laughs> but like if you say amen every once in a while, you know, it'll really motivate me to preach faster. That's all it means. It just, and so I really get to moving real fast. And then I'm telling you, I, 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 I got to tell you what I did one time. I went to one church. I went to this black church. And, uh, and, I, and I got me this sermon. I prepared it. Uh, uh, and I said, okay, I'm going to go and I preach it. And, and, but, but right before I went, I said, I'm going to test it out at this white church. And so I went to this white church, and I preached that sermon long, as hard as I possibly could. And Lord, folks just looked at you the whole time. <laughs> and I said, Lord, this is hard, right? It took me an hour and 45 minutes to preach that sermon. <laughs> so then the next week, I went over to the black church. And Lord, I preached that sermon hard. I was done in 15 minutes. <laughs> I mean, we were dismissed in 15 minutes. Because, you know, black folk, you know, yeah, they do it. They help you out a little bit. And so, and so I hope that I can get an amen every once in a while. Amen. I want to honor the wonderful pastor here tonight. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me tell you, a lot of you look and you're impressed with him, but there's a beautiful woman that is sitting right beside you. Yeah. Oh, come on, somebody. You know what? I just never have seen such a good-looking family. You know, that he's handsome, she's gorgeous, and two beautiful kids. I'm like, Lord, look at this. <laughs> at least one of them kind of missed the mark, but none of them missed the mark. But anyway, it's so, so I'm really pumped up because I'm staying with them, and I'm learning so much about them. And they are treating me like you wouldn't believe. I mean, I eat good. And I got to tell you, they got a secret weapon in the house, and I was just wondering, say, Lord, what do you do when you have a great secret weapon? And that's, that's Adam's mother. Have you ever just loved that woman? Yeah. Can I tell you a quick story? So I get in late last night, and I, I'm, I'm sure it's about you know, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. And Lord, it's just one of the best smells I ever had. And Lord, I go in and I see these muffins. And I said, Lord, it looks like these muffins are warm. And so, and so nobody else was in the house. They were, no one in the house was moving. And I went and picked up one of these muffins. And boy, that muffin, that fat demon jumped on me. Right? <laughs> and boy, I wore that muffin out, man. I'm telling you. I tell you that And then, you know, I said, I can't eat too much because I don't want to gain a whole lot of weight. And so I, had, I waited this morning. But boy, as soon as that sun came up, I had another muffin. But I'm telling you, if you've not had her muffins, you better get one of her muffins. And, and, and the reality is, you know, I, there were about six of them left today, and I was kind of strategizing, you know, how I'm going to eat these muffins, right? And they had some of the brothers come over, and they fed them lunch, and man, I took a nap and woke up, ain't but one muffin left. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to give up. But anyway, anyway, anyway. And so, it, you know, I want to I hear it again. So let me tell you why. I want to tell you why I came and prepared the messages. Is that I was trying to feel where you are. And so I would call pastor and ask your story, and he would tell me uh, your story and tell me, you know, well, this is where I think, you know, we are. And he was really excited. And, and then he came, and then, and then he was telling me about this wonderful church, and I was like, wow. And I, I'm telling you, what he described could not even describe what I experienced here. And seeing this beautiful place. And he talked about how you all have worked very hard, and you've given your resources, and how committed you've been to really, you know, making this happen. And I was just like, wow, that's just amazing. And then he told me about all the work that, that was done and renovating it and, uh, you know, and just, just everything you've done. And I said, wow, that's amazing. I said, so how are they feeling now? Because it's really exciting when you're doing all the work to make it look pretty. But then all of a sudden, it's harder when all, everything's done. Everything's completed. And for you to realize that really the issue is not this building. <laughs> the issue is Jesus. <laughs> I don't care how pretty this building looks. When you die, this building's gonna still be here. But where you are with Jesus, that's the issue, right? That's why I said to the world, aren't they? And let me tell you what I started thinking about. I started thinking about, because you know my daddy died when I was 11. And so I really only had four experiences with my daddy. And so my daddy, of the, one of the four experiences I remember about my daddy was a song he used to say. Now my daddy, he was a workaholic, and you know, and, and he worked hard, and he, he drove a truck, and when he came home, he would be exhausted. 
And, and when my daddy would come home, he would go in our den and he'd turn on his record player and he started playing this, this music. Now, 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 this music was called the blues. Anybody ever heard of the blues? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My daddy would start playing the blues. And you know what? I would just have so much joy in watching my daddy smile and laugh as he played the blues. But there was just one song that threw my daddy over the, over the top. And so it was, so I would be sitting there watching him, right? He'd, I'd be sitting, you, know, you know how a little 11 year old kid is just staring at his daddy? And then so all of a sudden this old bass guitar would come in. Doom, 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 doom. And so, and, 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 and so this guy would say, the thrill is gone. Doom, 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 doom. The thrill is gone away. Doom, 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 doom. Hey, hey, the thrill is gone. The thrill is gone away. And so he would sing that song. And I said, boy, what a nice little song that is. So one day when they got through, I walked up to my daddy. I said, daddy, I said, so he, I said, daddy, what's funny about that song? He said, well, he said, he said, this guy's named B.B. King. And B.B. King wrote that song. I said, really? I said, well, why did B.B. King write this song? He said, B.B. King went out with this lady, and she blew his mind. He dated her for eight months and decided to ask her to get married. And he said six months later, he wrote this song. The thrill is gone. Oh, 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 oh. The thrill is gone away. And I just laughed. We cracked up. You know what I mean? And so he said, yeah, he said, and that's what he said. My daddy said, drinking. He said, he said, most people, most people live on thrill. When something is new and when something is fresh, it is good to go and live by. It. But the reality is, it's not what to do when it's new. It is that once you've had that for a while, then what in the world do you do with it? Oh no, no, no! I'm telling the truth. Now, have you ever start, first start uh, uh, dating somebody and then you go and you and then they're the hottest thing in town, and then all of a sudden you get mad. The thrill is gone away. <laughs> No, 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 no. Right, right, right. Oh, have you ever bought a new house? And then when you get in there, everything's nice and pretty and clean. And then about a year, old dirty drawers are all hanging over the balcony. And you're like, man, we got to clean up the house. <laughs> because when you first did it, right, it is outstanding. I remember when I first, you know, I used to have a Dodge Ram 1500 pickup truck. I remember when I first got that thing, man. I mean, that thing was so pretty. And I said, man, I'm going to treat this truck. Like I never treated a truck and I drove it home and I washed it every day. I was out washing it and cleaning it up and making sure the rims look good. And then after about six months, there were banana peels and chicken bones in the back. <laughs> you know why? Because the thrill is gone. And the reality is that's how we are with our faith, isn't it? Yeah. Oh no, 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 that's the truth. No, no, no. You remember you first when the person first gave their lives to Jesus. I love Jesus, yes I do. I love Jesus, I love you. Man, they do Bible studies, they rehearse the ball. They're doing everything. And you give them about a year, you know what they say? The thrill is gone. The thrill is gone away. Isn't that right? Yes. You see, we are people who love to operate and move on thrills. Yes. And the reality is, is that now that you've done all this work, and now that it looks good, and the building is positive for growth, then where are you with Jesus? What about your heart? Where is, are you still on fire? How's the thrill going? <clears throat> is it challenging for you to get up and, and, and study the word? And is, it, is it difficult for you to, to form a, this wonderful discipline of prayer life? Is it, is it tough for you to even come to the church that you fixed up and cleaned up? Is it tough? Oh, is the thrill gone? You see, that's critical for you to ask that question tonight. <clears throat> because let me tell you, the purpose of which God has for you in this wonderful time, it's huge. See, you cannot walk in here thrill this, and you've got, you know, the courthouse right across the street where people come every day hurting and in pain. Yeah. You, God needs someone on fire to yeah. touch people's hearts and to love people like you never been loved. And 
Lord God come here. I'm not just coming here to preach you some sermon. I am saying there's too much at stake yes. for you to go wandering aimlessly through your spiritual journey. It's just too much at stake for you to go halfway and half in. It's too much at stake and God desires to use you like never before. And so let me hurry up. I'm getting out of here in a minute, I'm telling you. And so let me hear. Uh, uh, so I want to go to a passage where a guy lost his fire. Oh, yes, he did. I just want to read it just a quick. This guy lost every bit of his fire. And so I just want to look at just a few principles. And then how God helped him restore his fire. I don't know if that's you tonight. I don't know if you need a fresh blow and a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit to touch your heart down in the depths, but that's what we want to talk about tonight. Is that all right? Amen. 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 So anyway, so, so if you have your Bibles, I didn't give you the verse. I probably should. I'll give you the one for tomorrow. But anyway, I'm just going to read it. Is that all right? Good. Amen. Thank you. Uh, and, so, and so I'm going to be in the Old Testament in the book of Judges. And if you have your Bibles, you can go to the sixth chapter. And, and, and you know, this, man, this thing was so good. Now, now I'm going to start beginning, uh, I think I want to start right here uh, uh, in verse 11. And listen to what verse 11 says. But then the angel of the Lord came and sat down beneath uh, the great tree of uh, Oprah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abzir. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. <laughs> Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But, 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 no. Gideon responded, how, how can I rescue Israel? My, 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 my clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh and I am the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you. And you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Oh, is that good? Is that good? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, Gideon was tripping. I'm sorry. Gideon, I mean, he was crazy. No, Gideon just didn't have it together out there. Gideon didn't have it together. No, 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 no. I understand. I get what Gideon was going through. Gideon had all kinds of opposition. He had all kinds of problems and pain. What Gideon would do is, is that Israel would go in and then they had been reduced to living in caves. And so, so what they would do is they still had to have food. So they'd go out and they would plant crops. And then, you know, as they plant, they'd have corn and cabbage and, and green beans. And they would plant all these crops. And as soon as they plant the crops, the Midianites would come in with their chariots and horses and run all over the crops and tear them up and they didn't have anything to eat. And so then they'd run back in the cave and they'd live in the cave. They were discouraged. They were. They were frustrated. Man, listen, every time they tried to get up, they were pushed down. And this is what I heard. If you want to take somebody, see, if you're going through a tough time in your life, it will suck your energy. Yes. That's what Gideon experienced. He was going through a tough time in his life, and I came to suggest that if, that, that, yeah, maybe you lost your fire because you're going through a tough time. See, when problems and pains and, and, and all types of crisis comes in our lives, we have a tendency of getting caught up, and we look at the pain and the problem and all of the drama that's going on in our life. In other words, this is what I, if I had to give you a point, going right down a point, you know how we like giving points, right? I would say what happened is Gideon allowed his condition, ah, to dictate his position. Oh, did you hear that? Did you hear that? No, no, listen to it. I think that's what he did. He allowed his condition to dictate his position. See, that was his condition. His condition was, all the pain, oh, I'm going through this, and I'm going through that. And maybe some of you are going through it tonight. Maybe it's your health that you're going through. Maybe it's your finances. 
that you're going through. Maybe it's some crazy parents you got that you're going through, or maybe it's some crazy children you're going through. But maybe the condition, it looks bad. And you say, well, God, you know what? You can't love me. I don't even feel that you hear me. <laughs> and Gideon comes. He says, the angel of the Lord shows up in the midst of him frustrated. In the midst of all of the pain. In the midst of his condition. And did you hear what God said? Oh, did you listen to this. This is what God said. He, I mean, the angel of the Lord. I know you, you can't miss this. You cannot miss this. Uh, you listen to it really well. It says, oh, yeah, yeah, you hear it. Yeah, right, 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 right here in verse 10. Here, here, go right. The angel of the Lord came and sat down beneath the tree uh, at Ophrah, which belonged uh, to Joash of the clan of Abazur. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat in the bottom of a wine press to hide it, the grain from many nights. And here it comes in verse 12. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Ah! See, 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 Gideon was stuck in his condition. But the angel said, no, no, it's not about your condition. It's about your position. Gideon, you are somebody. God, I don't want you to forget that. That you don't belong to this world. You belong to me. Amen. Amen. See, he was in condition, but the Lord was trying to elevate him back to his position. I don't care what's going on around you, Gideon, but what's going on around you is much more. It cannot even compare to what needs to go on inside of you. You are somebody, and don't you ever let anybody tell you, God, somebody, that you're nobody. Don't you look at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. I'll read the word. Listen, don't you realize that Genesis says that we are made in the image of God? Don't you realize that Psalms 139 say that we are fearfully and wonderfully made? And John 1 12 says we are a child of God. And if you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that we are a new creation. And then in Ephesians, you know they said we are God's workmanship. We are God's handiwork, made anew in Him to do His work. We are somebody, and we can never allow anybody to tell us God somebody that we're nobody because we are somebody. You need to stick your chest out and look the devil in the eyes and say, Satan, you are a liar. What God says about me is true. What his word says about me is true. And I will never allow a lie to get this word I do. Amen. 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 Isn't that something? And so listen, you need your fire. And listen, that should set you on fire tonight. You should be able to stick your chest out and say, I'm so going to your school. You should be able to tell them, I am somebody. Yes, I am. You've been going to your marriage. Your husband's been beating you down. Maybe I am somebody. I don't care what you say. I don't care how you try to define it. I am somebody because he made me, not you. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the truth. But let me hurry up. Amen, amen. <laughs> Can I shift a little bit? But then I was reading. I said he lost his mind because he lost, really lost his identity. He lost who he was. And that's why the angel of the Lord tried to restore who he was. But there's something else in here I learned. Uh, why he lost his, you know, really why he lost his identity. So, so in verse 13, listen to what it says here. In verse 13, it says, it's, oh, now, now let me tell you, this is pathetic. I mean, if you think the passage is bad, it gets worse. Listen to 13. 13 is the most incredible passage. Listen to this verse. Sir, Gideon replied, if... If, listen, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites? Oh. Gideon must have been smoking some weed. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, he must have been on drug times at the <laughs> That's the truth. He had to be. I mean, but did you see his problem? You see his problem in there, right? Some of you are psychologists. Listen to what he says. I mean, listen to what he says. See, see, the key in verse 10 is this. Where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Oh! Where are all the miracles 
our ancestors told us about. Listen one more time. Where are all the miracles our ancestors turned, told us about? You see, Gideon never took ownership of his faith in the Lord. See, he was dependent upon the relationship that his ancestors had with the Lord. But he never took ownership and said, wait a minute. I've got to know the Lord for myself. Right. It's kind of like what happens with teenagers. They grow up going to church with their yes. parents all their lives. Yes. But at some point, you've got to stop worshiping the God of your mama and your daddy. And you've got to take ownership of your own faith right. and say, I'm going to be a child of God. And I'm going to walk. your parents say they're not good enough to take you through a storm. You need to turn around and say, God, I need to know you for myself. That's right. Now, I remember when I had to take on ship because I didn't give my life to the Lord until 1984. I was in NFL. You know, I was out there doing everything. And I was in NFL until all of a sudden, but I remember the chaplain for the Cleveland Browns told me, he said, Ricky, I want you to keep a track record of when God blesses you. He said, keep a track record. When God shows up miraculously in your life. Mm. And I said, what, what does that mean? He said, I want you to just journal, write it down. Mm. When God blesses you. And I won't ever forget the day when I walked into the Art Modell's office. And Art Modell said, I said, Art Modell, I said, well, listen, it's time for me to retire. I know I'm going to start enough time before you, but it's time for me to go. And he looks at me and says, Ricky Bolden, who's going to take care of you? Who's going to find you? Well, he didn't know what Tom had already told me. I looked at Art and I said, Art, I said, I don't know how you expect me to respond. But to God, when it looks like I was going to get cut in 1984, but God kept me on that football team. The same God when my mama got into a car accident and God saved her life. The same God that when I wanted to go back to school and get my degree and God, he gave me favor, he's the one that did it. The same God that showed up when I got hurt and had broken bones that was there with me to comfort me when you didn't come to the hospital, God is still here. That God, based upon everything he's done in the past, God is still with me today. Amen. <laughs> When I had a son and Michael was born, he only weighed one pound and three ounces. I just write it down. When God delivered my mother-in-law, when she died and she was in a coma for over a month, God was there and God brought her back and now she's walking with her chest sticking out. God was there when Mary Bolden died and when all the pains and problems that I've gone through in life, see, I had to experience God for myself. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, it's not enough for you to go by what your mama did. You need to take ownership of your own spiritual journey. Yes. You need to say, God, I'm going to walk with you and keep my track record for myself. Yes. So when I need to be reminded who you are, I can look back over my life yes. and I can see that you've intervened and that you've moved. And based upon what you've done in the past, yesterday, I know you're going to do something Amen. special. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, can I, can, I, can, I, can I give you one more? Yes. So, so, so he was Gideon, and he had an identity issue, but he also, you know, he, he didn't take ownership of his faith. And that's why he really didn't get excited about the Lord. But there was one other thing he had that I think is the key. And I think the biggest lesson that the Lord is trying to teach Gideon in the passage. And I think it comes in the form of what we call today pronouns. And yeah, that's what we are pronouns. You all know what a pronoun is. A pronoun, what it does is that it, 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 it is a way of looking at the object of a sentence. And it uses a different word to refer to the object. For example, Ricky is the object of the sentence. A pronoun is anything that would describe Ricky other than the noun Ricky. So the pronoun is the me, the my, or the I. That's what it is. That's what it is. He's got a pronoun that will define who I am, it's, it's, it's Ricky. And so you have first, second, and third person pronouns, yeah. Yeah, so, so anytime you start talking, referring to yourself, guess what terms you use? You don't say, Ricky had to go to the school, Ricky had to do No, no, you say, I had to go to the school because school's gonna help me, and because I had to walk to school, then me. You see, you always point to yourself, right? Yeah. See, a pronoun is like a boomerang. 
A pronoun is like you throw out a boomerang, guess what it comes right back to? It comes right back to you. That's what a pronoun. What I want you to do is I want you to help me count these pronouns that get in you. I'm going to read two verses. And I want you now, a pronoun, remember what it is. It's me, my, I, anything that refers back to Gideon is a pronoun. You got what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Oh, come on. Y'all not going to help me, are you? I'm trying to get you to help me now. But I want you to see, I want you to count. Two verses. That's all I'm going to read. I'm not going to read three verses. I'm going to read two verses. Now, now, every time I want you to count out loud. Now, here, here it goes. I'm going to start right in verse 13. Sir, Gideon responded, if the Lord is with us, One. come on loud, keep up. Why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord has brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and and handed us over to the Midianites? Now I'm going to skip to 15. But Lord Gideon responded, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Two verses at 11 pronouns. You see his issue? And what God was trying to get him get to say. In two verses, 11 pronouns. This is not about you giving me. I ask you to go and save your people. I ask you to go and rescue and take over me. It's not about you. See, so often what we do is, is we make life about us. And life is not about any of you. The reality is, is that if God turns you loose in this world, you're just going to mess it up like you've already done. Mm-hmm. But when God is with you, then God's going to do a great work. See, let me tell you what Gideon did. Look what happens when you use pronouns. And that's what I'm telling you. You've got to be careful about pronouns. You know, so have you ever heard people talk about, you know, their success? And, oh, this is my education. Look at my house. These are my children, and, and this is my car, and this is my wife, and, and yeah, 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 this is all my furniture in my house. Look at these nice clothes I have bought for me, because everything is me, my, and I, and oh God, look at me. <laughs> look what happens to you. You get bigger, and you get bigger, and you get bigger. And you get bigger. But guess what happens to God? God gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And God was looking at Gideon and said, it's not about you. It's really about me. And what God was inviting Gideon to do, he says, Gideon, Instead of you getting big, why don't you make me bigger? You are the king of kings. You are the lord of lords. You are the bright and morning star. You are the lily of the valley. You are the first and you are the last. You are the alpha. You are the omega. You are the beginning. You are the end. You are bigger and bigger and bigger. And guess what happens to Gideon? Mm-hmm. He gets smaller and smaller and smaller. It is not about who he is. It is about he who he is. You know, I remember I used to read this verse. I never got it. But there was a verse that says, Oh, magnify the Lord yes. with me. And you know, I had an best year. She's my spiritual mama. And she couldn't see toward the end of her life. And I guess it would get this thing called a magnifying glass. And one day she left it on the bed and I wanted to look in it. And as I looked in it, every object that I placed the magnifying glass over, guess what happened to it? It got bigger. Yes. Who magnified yes. the Lord with me? Let us exalt his name together. Let's make God bigger and bigger and bigger. And when you come in here, no, no, you want to appreciate the building. But it's not about you. It is about this God that we serve that is bigger and bigger and bigger. And so 
listen, I know it's time for you to go home. But here's, here's why I came. See, here's the reality. Is that so often what happens to people is they get caught between the stove and the refrigerator. Oh, okay, you like that. Let me tell you what I'll be back. That's what they did get caught right in between. See, when I was a kid, you know, I'm from Texas, and so we go to Jasper, Texas to have our homecoming. And like my mama had 10 babies in 10 years, but all of her brothers and sisters had over 10 kids. And so it was 13 of them. So when we came, we came like with droves, you know what I mean? And then, and then three of us all played in NFL at the same time. My cousin Leonard, I, I wore a 15, Leonard wore 19. And, and I was 6'6", six, six, Leonard was 6'9". Six, and I weighed 300, Leonard weighed 350. We had some monsters, right? And so, and so I remember I used to always go at the homecoming. And, and so and my mom would go in to cook. And mama had a problem. She would go into the kitchen and she'd look and, she'd, and all the two utensils would go, be gone. And, I, and so mama, she knew where they were. So she called me and my cousin Leonard and she said, Leonard, you move the stove, Rick, you get the refrigerator and slide them apart because they all are between the stove and the refrigerator. <laughs> and because what would happen is during the year, people would be down there cooking what they call fat back. That's like bacon, you know, with a lot of fat in it. And so they'd be cooking bacon. And so what would happen is the grease would pop out of the skillet onto their hands. You know what they do? They drop the utensil. The utensil would fall right in between the stove and the refrigerator. And so, and so mama said separate it. And so, and so after a whole year, all the utensils would be in between. And so my mom was a big woman. You know what I mean? She would have this old ugly house coat with, you know, these big quilting. It looked like it was quilted, right? So she'd come in and she'd have a pair of plows. And so, and so, and so. And I would ask, I said, Mama, you got the stove that gets so hot and the refrigerator that gets so cold. Why do you have them next to each other? She said, I don't know, because that's how my mama did it. And so she'd just move them. And so I moved them. And so my mama would kind of squat down, because she's a big woman. And she squat down, and then she kind of wiggled her bottom. I don't know why she wiggled it. And, but then she started working. She started working the, the utensils, because you know all this stuff that would fall in between on top of them would be good. Have you ever seen good? And Gook would just kind of stick them all together. And so she'd be wiggling them. And so she would be pulling them. And so she <coughs> ah, and so she'd pull them out with these pliers. And she would have a pot, pot of hot boiling water on the stove boiling. And then she would just like she would drop these utensils into this boiling water so that the heat from the boiling water would free the utensil of the gook. I found out that's what people are. People are caught between the stove and the refrigerator. They're really neither hot nor cold. They're just stuck in between. And so when you go to Revelation 3 and you talk about this church of Laodicea, when it talks about lukewarm churches, that's what it's talking about. See, a lot of people read that passage in, in Revelation 3 and they start saying, oh man, and so Billy Graham, he likes to preach that to lost people. But that verse is not about lost people. It's about believers. It's to the church of Laodicea. It's about people just like us who have just simply gotten trapped between the stove and the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, you know, you get freed out. Oh! And what God is inviting you tonight to do is to say, you know what I need? To, I am not going all out. Yes. I have lost some fire. Mm -hmm. And I just need God to restore my joy. Amen. And what God desires to do is he decides to, to pull you out and place you in a part of water called the Holy Spirit. Amen. So that he can melt down some of the book that's really began to form around your life. Right. So that you can now be free to be used in service again. Amen. God has said, no, no, I need to use you. Yeah. I created you to be used. That's why I put the courthouse across the street for you to be used. Amen. That's why I have so many poor people for you to be used. Amen. That's why I have single moms and young men in these parents. I have them here for you. But you can't do it if you're not able to be used. And so God is saying, how in the world do I get you to be free? You know, the, the reason I came here really was to pray. And see, that's why I think an altar call tonight is appropriate. It's for you to say, God, I want to commit to be free to be used by you like never before. But this town is counting on me. My marriage is counting on me to be, to be free. Yes, and my children are counting on me. My neighbors are counting on me. My coworkers are counting on me. But God, I know I don't have the fire inside of me. I'm just kind of going through. And I can't call me here just to pray for you. And so let me tell you what I'm doing. I don't beg people to come to the altar.
But I'm going to invite you, and I want you to come because that's what I'm here for tonight. I'm here just to pray for you. And if you hear and you say, Rick, I know that I'm not where God wants me to be. That's me. I want you to just write up. Just quit this with this stand up and come right down. If you say, Rick, I know I'm not where I need to be. But I know that I'm stuck. I need God to release me. To be all that God's called me to be. Mm -hmm. That's what he's asking you to do. I desire that God would free me up from the good. Maybe, you, maybe you're living a life and, and you know it's sin. It may be internet stuff that you're trapped in. It could be maybe even an affair or you lying to your spouse. It could be your anger that's out of control. What God is saying is I want to free you up tonight from all the good that's kind of settled in on your life. And that's really going to stop you from being all that God wants you to be. That's what he wants to do tonight. That God has said, I want to use you. I didn't place castle here just to be decorations. That's right. I placed castle to be here so that people can be used like never before to impact people. Mm -hmm. Would you just bow with me in a word of prayer? Jesus, I just thank you so much for this night. Jesus. Thank you for this wonderful example of Gideon. A man, just like us, who just gets stuck sometimes. Mm -hmm. But Father, we know that you desire that we be free to love you and serve you like never before. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus, at this moment, in this space, I ask you to blow a fresh wind of your Holy Spirit mm -hmm. into the heart of every person on this altar. Mm -hmm. I pray that you will light a fire like never before. That, Father, they will be intentional about impacting people. That, Father, you will move and guide and direct. That you will strategically bring people into their lives. Yes. That they can impact right here, Father. Yes. And, Father, we look forward to the results, Father. Because we know that you, only you can do it. Yes. We look for marriages being healed tonight. Yes. Father, we look for homes to be healed tonight. Amen. We look for men standing up like never before tonight. Yes. Father, we look for spiritual gifts to be used like never before tonight. Amen. Father, we look for people releasing their resources so that your generosity can be displayed Amen. tonight, Jesus. Yes. We look forward to this. Yes. We release my brothers and sisters to you, Jesus. And we pray that you will clean them like never before. Give us. And I pray that it doesn't stop now, that we go home. And that we begin to write out names that we can start praying for. That we can wake up in the morning reading your word like never before. That we can be intentional about developing a prayer life and having the discipline it takes to walk and love you like never before. We submit and commit our brothers and sisters. Let's make this thing happen like never before. To God be the glory. God bless you.